Thanks for listening to the Spark Medical Education for Curious Minds, where we bring you the latest ideas and insights from faculty, students, and staff in UCSF's medical education community. I'm Megan O'Connor, Instructional Designer with the Technology Enhanced Education Group. And I'm Karen Fleming, Communications Manager for the Office of Medical Education. This episode is a special edition devoted to Back to School Week and a welcome to this year's incoming class of first-year medical students. We'll hear from three School of Medicine education deans as they reflect on their medical career highlights, mentors, and inspirations. Stay tuned for interviews with Dr. Catherine Lucy, Vice Dean for Medical Education and Executive Vice Dean for the School of Medicine, Dr. Lee Jones, Associate Dean for Students, and Dr. Karen Hauer, Associate Dean for Assessment. Find out what topped their list of medical school memories and motivators. So I'm here with Vice Dean for Education and Executive Vice Dean for the School of Medicine, Dr. Catherine Lucy. Here we are approaching the first week of medical school for this year's incoming class. So Catherine, looking back over your medical career and reflecting on medical school, what were some early motivators and inspirations for you? In medical school, I think my primary motivators were really love of the content. As soon as I got into medical school, started learning about biochemistry and physiology and doctor-patient relationship, it just felt right. I felt like I had found my home in a content and discipline area that um, resonated with my personality, resonated with my interests, um, and also allowed me to work continuously with people who um, really were in need. And so that was one of the first things I recognized when I went to medical school was um, how exciting and interesting the content is and how really remarkable it is to get to work with patients who, um, when they are feeling most vulnerable, are willing to let medical students uh, enter into their lives just for the purpose of helping them learn to become somebody else's doctor in the future. And so that I found to be both exciting and inspiring. And then I ended up very um, fortuitously at UCSF right at the beginning of the HIV epidemic in 1982. And what I found then was a community of physicians uh, as well as other health professionals, pharmacists, uh, and even people in the community such as community activists who were all working together to tackle what at the time we had no idea was causing the death of just literally thousands of young men Um, and within San Francisco and across the country. And the HIV epidemic started off as being a total mystery at a time when I really thought as a physician all mysteries in medicine had been solved. And so seeing people come together, work in biomedical science, work in community outreach, work in social and behavioral science around behavioral change, uh, really, I think, influenced the way I look at medicine today and in many ways um, are the foundational elements to our Bridges curriculum, which recognizes that the very complex problems we have today in medicine are uh, only going to be solved if we're able to work collaboratively across many disciplines and many domains of science and with not only all of our other colleagues in the other health professions, but also our patients and their families to solve them. So things like um, that we're facing today, like the opioid epidemic, um, or healthcare disparities, um, or you know, well, aging and its consequences on the brain, mental health issues, all of these are really complex problems that I think being a resident at UCSF back in the 80s helped me learn to think about and hopefully uh, learn to train a new generation of physicians to solve. Do you recall any particular mentors, teachers, or patients who particularly inspired you, and if so, how? Wow, there's so many, it's really hard. Um, It's hard to sort of pick a few, but I'll I'll take a couple. One um, is still right here at UCSF, and her name is Molly Cook. She's a faculty member in general internal medicine and has been uh, a, she was a founding member of the Academy of Medical Educators, which is the institution within the School of Medicine that recognizes through membership the very top educators in the, in the school. And Molly was uh, a few years ahead of me at UCSF um, when I became chief resident at San Francisco General Hospital, which is now known as the Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital. Uh, Molly was the first person I knew who had decided medical education was going to be her formal career. I knew all along that I wanted to blend education and uh, medicine. My mother was a chemistry teacher. I kind of grew up with a teaching gene, and I uh, taught pretty much all the way through college and medical school and different coursework. But I never really thought about teaching Um, as a formal career. It seemed to be almost an avocation. And Molly helped me begin to think about um, how I could uh, ensure that the teaching I was doing was uh, 
as high quality as possible and to learn how to really engage with uh, medical students and residents in a thoughtful way that helped them not only learn the content of medicine, but the um, incredible developmental um, trajectory that they are going to face as they move from being a young medical student to a more seasoned physician. So Molly was, I think, one of my really early mentors in medical education. I'll talk a bit about a patient who really inspired me uh, kind of midway through my career. And again, I feel very fortunate that uh, throughout my career, I have been able to work in predominantly safety net hospitals. So these are hospitals that care for patients who are um, the most socioeconomically vulnerable, who often have uh, no health care insurance before the Affordable Care Act. And, um, who really um, have not been afforded the opportunities in society that many of us grew up taking for granted. So my first was at San Francisco General Hospital, but then I also worked in San Antonio uh, and in Washington, D.C. Um, at an inner city hospital that cared for uh, very vulnerable patients. And I had um, two patients that I'd like to sort of reflect on, one um, whose name was Hildred, who um, was a wonderful patient I took care of for 10 years, uh, quite healthy older woman, and developed a series of symptoms that led me to believe she had a um, mild uh, uh, joint type problem. And we finally diagnosed her, and I was really excited about finding the right diagnosis. And I remember um, going in and talking to her and telling her, you know, good news. Um, we found out what's wrong for you, and and we have the right treatment. Um, and I was excited because we had the answer. And she was devastated because she had a disease. Uh, and she had never thought of herself as someone with a disease. And that encounter really made me um, think about always remembering the patient on the other side of the intellectual exercise that we work on. I spent a lot of time trying to make accurate diagnoses and teach students and residents how to make accurate diagnoses. But it's always important that even though that's an interesting process, um, the real impactful aspect of that is helping the patient come to grips with having a diagnosis and knowing that means what it means for the rest of their life. And so I thought that was a really incredibly powerful lesson for me. And it happened when I was you know, reasonably well into my career. Um, so I think it's another important thing. It talks to you about always thinking about what is the patient in front of you teaching you. Even if you think you know a lot about medicine and have been practicing for years, the patient in front of you is unique. Um, and you can learn from them as long as you're open to learning from them. The other patient um, that I think of instantly when people ask about what patients um, did you learn a lot from uh, was a patient who um, I had cared for for a very long period of time. Uh, and um, interestingly, uh, she had been divorced from her husband for maybe 20 years. And he came back into her life because he had acquired uh, HIV infection. And um, this woman who was, had really marginal means herself took her ex-husband um, into her home and nursed him through his disease, which ultimately ended up being fatal. Um, and she did so despite the fact that, um, that she and her, her ex-husband ex had not parted on good ways. Uh, and I asked her about that. I said, you know, how is it that you're able to do this? And she said, you know, um, this is what people are called to do. They're called to give whatever effort they can to help other people. And this was a patient telling a doctor this. And it's been so profoundly impactful to me to listen to patients who sometimes have uh, not a lot but are still willing to be generous with others, whether it's with their doctors giving them advice um, or whether it's people around them. And so it really taught me that um, there is no such thing as can't do. Um, and that also has helped me think about engaging with my patients around the other aspects of, um, of their lives. So I think I, I, those are the three stories I'd like to share today. I think there's so many others. And um, I was talking actually to Dr. Cook, my, the one I mentioned earlier yesterday, and each of us sat there for about a 30-minute car ride uh, remembering patients that had impacted us. So I, my hope for the students is that you'll keep all of the patients you care for in your mind and look for something you can learn about from each of them. So that's a nice segue into my next question is that 
we're approaching the first week for this income cl incoming class. And what advice would you give first year students before they begin this exciting aspect of their, their journey? Wow. Uh, first, um, take a deep breath uh, and recognize, honestly, this is a marathon. Uh, this, you have to pace yourself. You're going to be learning, not just for the four years that you're in medical school and three years in residency, but for 40 years that you're going to be in this incredible career. And so um, realize that there is no way you can learn everything. Um, and there's certainly no way you can le learn everything in the first week or first month. So pace yourself and get used to the idea that what we really want you to learn is how to think about things, how to ask good questions, and how to master enough information that allows you to um, take the next step in whatever aspect of education you have. Um, the second I'd say, take good care of yourself. Uh, it's well known that the best people in terms of developing expertise are those who not only um, practice their craft, meaning study on a daily basis, but importantly get sleep at night. Sleep is when your memories are consolidated. And so from a pure neuroscience perspective, sleep is not an, uh, is not an option uh, in medical education. It's really a requirement. It's part of your job as a medical student to figure out how to set up your life so that you can get a good seven hours of sleep a night so that you can let those memories consolidate. And the third is um, open yourself up to new friendships. Uh, there are amazing people who choose to come here to medical school, some of whom will start this week with you. Others have already been here for a while. And some are, you know, um, MS45s like me, uh, people who went to medical school a long, way, long time ago. Think about uh, being curious and asking people about themselves and, and make as many new friends from different um, parts of your world as you possibly can. Those friendships will be what sustain you when you're having a tough time and also what ground you um, when perhaps things seem to be um, a little bit chaotic. So I think those would be my advice for the new class. Have fun. Now that we've heard from Dr. Lucy about patients who inspired her and what she found most impactful in medical school, let's find out what words of wisdom Associate Dean for Students Dr. Lee Jones has for first year medical students. So I, you know, I think um, I was so excited when I started medical school because um, I had wanted to be a physician since I was pretty young. I remember my mother says fourth or fifth grade. And I think it was a love of both science and humanities and mixing those two and really having been brought up with a service focus to community and um, family members that, that made it very exciting to be able to put all those things together uh, into one career. Um, and I went in thinking I was going to be a primary care pediatrician and changed that a bunch of times. Um, and I think it's because I fell in love with a lot of things as I rotated through there and got to see some amazing clinicians, both physicians as well as nurses and social workers, that it was just really inspiring to see how much difference they could make in people's lives. So that segues well into my next question. I was going to ask you about particular people that inspired you. So for you, were there mentors, teachers, or patients that you'd like to call out especially as being something that really contributed to your overall impression of medical school and what you learned and how you grew? Yeah, so I think there were a couple of people. I, I remember... Um, Actually, from being quite young, my pediatrician was always wonderful. Uh, he took a lot of extra time. Once he found out I was interested in medicine and science, he really encouraged me to, uh, to pursue that and talked a lot about how much he loved what he did, which really showed through. And then once I got to medical school, I had some amazing mentors, um, including actually my interview. for medical. I went to Columbia Medical School, and there was a pathologist named Dr. Whitley Branwood that was, interviewed me, and I actually stayed in contact with him until he died um, many years later because I just found the interview very inspiring. He was just very personable and excited and really conveyed the... Um, the importance of staying connected with people that were teachers and were mentors. And he continued to do that throughout um, the rest of his life for me, even though he was a pathologist and I was a psychiatrist. And some would think that those two are about as far apart as you can get. If you think about yourself as a learner before you started medical school and after, can you call out some particular changes for you in the way that you thought or the ways that you wanted to grow after going through medical school? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's actually pretty easy. I was I wrote my own major in college as an anthropology, philosophy, and education major, um, and my my uh, 
senior project was looking at a variety of different education modes at the elementary level. And so what I learned there was to focus on concepts and how to apply them and less so on details. Uh, so when I got to medical school, that's how I was thinking about things. And then I promptly failed not the just the first, but the first two medical school exams because it was biochemistry and it was about details and I didn't pay attention to that. And I think what, what was different about me post-medical school is being able to focus and recognizing the need to focus on the overall picture as well as the, the, the small details and figuring out how to how to zoom in and out appropriately to do that. So medical school, first of all, the amount of knowledge is phenomenal that you learn. Um, the other thing that, that I think medical school taught me is that, that things change. Um, I mean, there's a, there's a saying, I don't know how true it is, that 25% of what you learn in medical school is out of date and wrong by the time you graduate. And medical school really taught me that you have to stay on top of things and continue to learn. And the whole concept of lifelong learning was really driven home. The enthusiasm Dr. Jones expressed certainly makes me excited for this year's incoming class. Let's see what Dr. Karen Hauer, Associate Dean for Assessment, found most impactful during her training and who inspired her. I've always been interested in patients as people and trying to understand their whole story. So what's going on with them medically, what are they feeling, what are they experiencing, but also what's going on with them in their personal life, in their family life, um, how do we put all that together to understand the whole patient and develop a care plan that's comprehensive. I also just find it really fun to learn about all the different people that I've met through patient care that I would never have known if I had chosen a different career path. Do you recall any particular mentors, teachers, or patients that were particularly impactful for you? I've always been interested in teaching and in education, so I've really gravitated toward mentors that are good clinicians and also good teachers. One of my early mentors who um, was very memorable was my first um, project mentor in family medicine. One of the junior faculty when I was a medical student was doing a study to interview women who were homeless and staying in shelters about their understanding of HIV infection. This was earlier in the HIV epidemic and not a lot was known in the community. There was also a lot of misinformation. So my project was to go to um, shelters for homeless women who had children um, in different areas of San Francisco and interview them and learn what they understood about HIV infection and then um, try to think about how we could educate them to live healthy lifestyles and correct any misinformation that they had about that infection. So that was a great project that blended clinical medicine and patient education and also got me out of UCSF hospitals into the community to really see patients where they were trying to make a life and trying to care for their families. When you think about yourself at the start of your career and at the end of medical school, how do you think or what most shaped and changed you in terms of the ways that you learned? I came into medical school with a very broad vision of patient care, but I was not from a medical family and didn't really know anything about the particular specialties. And I was um, the type of student who went through every clerkship and every clinical experience thinking, oh, this is what I want to do. I want to be this kind of doctor. So I got to the end of the third year and really felt like I liked everything. And so it was going to be hard to choose a specialty. I remember going back to my medical school personal statement and reading what I had written when I really didn't understand even what the specialties were, but it talked about um, these ideas I had around caring for the whole patient and about incorporating education into my career as a physician, and that was really helpful to me in finally making my specialty choice of internal medicine and thinking about how I could have a career that gave me the intellectual challenge that I wanted and also fulfilled these broad missions that I'd had when I was coming into medical school. 
So it was interesting to kind of come full circle after considering just about every specialty and thinking that they might all be interesting to me to finally making a choice that resonated with where I'd come from early on. So what pearls of wisdom would you offer this year's incoming class in terms of what they could most look forward to in medical school or any of, I guess, the the wisdom you would offer as they approach White Coat? Wow. I would say, first of all, um, enjoy this time. It's a really hard time, but it's a really fun time, and it's a really um, special point in your journey toward becoming a doctor where so many things are new. I would say really spend time with your patients. Look for opportunities to talk with them, to spend time with their families, to really understand what they're going through. Um, That's just the beauty and the privilege of being a physician, that people will open up to you in ways that it's hard to imagine before you're a physician. I would also say um, spend time taking care of yourself. I think that you're classmates, your coach, your other teachers are good resources when you need some help rejuvenating or need um, reminders about how to pace yourself. Um, The path toward being a doctor is a long one and you need to take care of yourself along the way and think about how you're going to balance your professional goals with your personal goals and your obligations to the other people and things that are important to you in your life. Um, Sometimes it feels hard to balance all those things, and I have found myself that my classmates and my mentors were just really great resources in helping me through those times when I wasn't sure how to balance everything. Hearing from three education deans today is a fitting lead as we approach the White Coat Ceremony August 4th. The ceremony signifies the beginning of the students' medical education at UCSF and their commitment to uphold the honor code. We hope you're subscribing to The Spark. Stay tuned for our next episode in September as we celebrate the 10-year anniversary of the school's program in medical education for the urban underserved, also known as Prime US. The music in this podcast comes from Pottington Bears Egress, licensed under CC by NC3.0 and available at the Internet Archive. 